Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? This is Lindsay Lerner, and you're listening to The Cost of the Status Quo. More people than ever are questioning why they do what they do and forging their own path. And on this show, I sit down with these entrepreneurs, trailblazers, creatives, and overall awesome beings to discuss the ideas, the opportunities, and the overall tips and tricks they're using so that the rest of us can do the same. This is The Cost of the Status Quo. Elevate your sound game with Filbit, the perfect upgrade for your recording or office space. Our producer, Andrew, has been pushing for a better recording environment. Say goodbye to basic egg crates and hello to stylish felt tiles that not only reduce 35% of ambient noise, but also show off your unique design sense. And the best part, these tiles are made from recycled bottles, making your recording space both stylish and eco-friendly. Get 10% off at feltright.com with code CSQ10. That's CSQ10. Let's give Andrew and you, our listeners, the top-notch sound that you deserve while making a positive impact on the planet. Share your creative Feltright designs with us and join the sustainable sound revolution. Hey there, welcome to The Cost of the Status Quo. Today we have a very special guest, Janice Burrell. Janice is an experienced leader with over 15 years of experience working at the Transportation Security Administration, TSA, and many more in leadership roles across various industries. She's skilled in everything from social media to social care, analysis, government, training and facilitation, and leadership development. Janice holds a Master of Science in Organizational Leadership from Capella University. Although Janice is now retired, she has a wealth of experience and knowledge to share with us and has left a major impact in every role that she's had. Join us as we discuss Janice's journey through her career and how she's made a difference in the industry throughout her tenure. Thanks so much for listening. And please don't forget to rate and review across all platforms. It truly does help. And let's jump on in. Can you tell me where you grew up and a little bit about what that was like for you? I did grow up in the South. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, back in the 60s and the 70s. So uh, civil rights, I remember it, riding in the back of the bus, I remember that, two water fountains, all of that. I grew up as the daughter of a Baptist deacon. So, you know, dad's up in the front of the church praying down on one knee, and then you see that one eye open. And you know that I was coming to you, right? So you look at that eye and, you know, you'd always kind of point to your to your stepbrother like, he did it. It wasn't me. I got the halo on top of my head. But I, I had a great childhood. I can't say anything bad. Played in a band, had a good time, went to college, told my daddy he was wrong. You know, he didn't know anything. So I lost my scholarship because I was too busy eating grapes and bean pies instead of doing my homework. And uh, joined the military. And the day I said, Dad, I, I joined the Air Force. And he said, good. And I'm like, good? <laughs> Where does he come off? What does he know? But hey, it, was, it was a good job. I, I cannot complain. <laughs> okay, so you joined the military, specifically the Air Force. Was there a specific reason you chose the Air Force? First off, any military person will tell you the joke about, you know, the Marines in the Army and the Navy, but uh, my dad was Army. So uh, it's funny, the man that I um, had to tell him he was wrong all the time, I've kind of mimicked his life. He was Army and worked post office. I was Air Force and worked UPS. And so what was that like? That's the like, late 70s. I was very proud to be in the, in the Air Force and probably would have stayed longer, but I went to Turkey, the location where... There are no American troops, at least there weren't any in in the 70s, 80s, when the 80s when I went. Well, I was the only woman on the plane. True story. And I get these orders for uh, Turkey. And so I'm going to Turkey. So I have to pull out my little kid. I'm like 18, 19 years old. I got to pull out the map. I'm like, where the heck is Turkey? And I look at it and I go, wow, okay. So going over on the plane, I'm a little nervous, but hey, I'm in uniform. I'm good. I know I'm around my, you know, airmen. We get on this uh, plane. We fly from, gosh, I've never told this story anybody publicly, but we get on the plane. We fly from uh, Jersey to to Frankfurt, Germany, commercial airline. Everything is good. 
first get there, I go to the bathroom and I go to the last stall because I'm not, you know, I, I realized already that the first language is German and the second language is English when you're reading in the airport. So I'm very much aware I am not in America. But like I said, I think I'm all of 19 now. And I go to the last stall and I thought I locked the door. And I'm in mid going back to get to this toilet, right? Because I got to go. And uh, this lady opens the stall and starts yelling at me in German. And I don't know what to do. So I stand there, <laughs> you know, kind of if, as a girl, think about it mid back. And uh, finally, she walks away. So I close the stall, finish my business, and I leave. What I found out after I left the bathroom was I was supposed to tip her before I came in. Nobody bothered to tell me that, right? So, you know, I have never forgotten that. 19 was a long time ago because it's hilarious to me. But anyway, so we leave the um, we leave Frankfurt, and now we're all getting on this military aircraft to go to Turkey. And I am literally the only woman on this C-140 going in. It was, uh, I I never picked up my luggage. Let's just put it like that. It was really nice. (laughs) So, but Turkey was interesting. Stayed there for two years. Compliments of Uncle Sam. Learned a lot. Grew up a lot. Sent everybody leather coats for Christmas in my family because it was goat leather and it was cheap. Oh, man. And so do you think, or rather, how did your time in the military influence your leadership style and approach to problem solving now or throughout, you know, your whole life? Let me explain. When you're in the military and you do as I say, not as I do. That's it. You have leaders and you can't question those leaders because your life could depend on it. You know, they say, go jump off the building. It's sir, yes, sir. You know, you go jump off the building, you're thinking to yourself, this is not smart, but there's a reason for it. And I admire that leadership skill. What I think the military taught me more than anything is to learn how to follow. And I don't think you can be a good leader until you learn how to follow. Because a good leader is going to know when to follow and know when to lead. So I would say, I guess the not at all is not correct. It taught me how to follow, which in turn taught me how to lead. Because you have good leaders and you have bad leaders, no matter military or not, you've got to learn what you can pull from those people that aren't good leaders and figure out what you can use to make you a better leader. And so post, post Turkey, you come back to the States and then what happens? I do some more time in the military, finally get out. Uh, moved back. I was in California when I got out. I moved back to the East Coast uh, to be closer to family. I got a job at UPS. I tell everybody, you know that book, Everything I Learned, I Learned in Kindergarten? I say everything I learned, I learned at UPS. UPS taught me, it taught me the value, I'm going to say, of get your hands dirty, hard work, you know, a good sweaty day at the end of the day and you're feeling good about it. It taught me how to make money because there is good money to be made in working for UPS. And it also taught me a lot about management and leadership. Of course, their style was a little bit different. So I learned a different style of leadership, but I learned how to to manage the whole business, the customer service aspect, the employee aspect, the financial aspect. It was all right there. And I'm gonna say it was some of the greatest things I've ever learned was, was right there at UPS. You're working at UPS, learning all the things. And then was that an immediate jump to TSA next? So the stock for UPS went public. And a lot of people made a lot of money really quick. I did not have a a college education. I had college credits because remember, I dropped out of college. So I decided this was my opportunity to do something different and to reset in life. So I dropped out dropped out. I left my job at uh, UPS. I didn't drop out. Left my job at UPS and went to co- went back to college. Got my bachelor's, finished it, lost into uh, one of the local community colleges and said, hey, I want to teach, right? Even though I told everybody I was going to be an attorney, 
when I left, which was a lot of fun because they were like, oh, God, is she going to go work for the union? You know, because it was management at UPS. But anyway, I went to teach and they say, you can't teach unless you have a master's. I'm like, what are you talking about? You see my resume? I mean, ha, I have a good resume. You didn't see my resume? Yeah, I know stuff. Who are you talking to? I got a degree now. They said I needed a master's. So I went to school. I was like, you can't tell. I'll show you. And I got my master's and then uh, got offered a, a job. I won't tell you which airline, so we'll say with the airline that was paying a whole nine dollars an hour. And I said, well, what? I'm, like, I'm not working for you for nine dollars. You call me back when you have some money to talk about. Because remember, I just left UPS. So <laughs> I want money. Right. Right. I'm not to make money. It just. And then a friend of mine said, hey, listen, if you, if you want to work in the airport, why don't you work for TSA? I went, who? TSA, you know, and she, we talked about it. And I was like, OK. So I got a job at TSA. Actually, from I was in upstate New York at the time in Albany, and BWI called me. And so I said, and I moved back down to the, to the Maryland area and uh, started working at BWI. I hated it. It's the hardest job in the world. I've been in the military. I've been through basic training. This is hard. I don't think, you know, people don't understand. It's just a person standing there trying to do their job. So you have the public that's yelling at you constantly. You're, the gum on the bottom of your shoe is better. So, you know, you get these poor TSOs standing there being yelled at, coughed on, cursed out, you know, every day. And all they want to do is just do their job. So I hated that. And I would come home and cry every day almost because I thought, I was like, I'm not doing this job. This is horrible. And I was convinced by my significant other not to do that and to stick with it. And I did. And uh, eventually worked my way up into headquarters. And that is when I began to have fun. Because I was able to use my education to use a master's degree and I'm patting down little ladies and taking water bottles, taking water bottles, you know. So I was able to uh, to use my education to do something. And, and I got into this job. And at the time, it was called the Model Workplace Program Office. And our tagline was, is where the best people want to work and do the very best. And every time I still to this day, I can do that. Right. And I, I hear the toothpaste commercial with the gleam, you know, ding at the end. But anyway, so we were trying to make life better for everybody working. But since I hated my job and I understood that, I was really into trying to do that. So I did that for a few years. Anything really having to do with workforce engagement, I did it in TSA. And the more I did, the more I taught, the more I learned, I think the better leader I became. And then uh, started working on um, social media. I did a detail at uh, the Office of uh, Personnel Management and uh, came back and my boss says to me, hey, listen, do you want to take over the job Jason was doing? Well, I won't give you Jason's last name, but Jason's a Harvard graduate that his little words still make you pull out your dictionary thesaurus, right? I'm like, Jason, you know, like, I can't do this guy's job, but I got a master's and I don't understand what the heck he's talking about, right? But I, I took a book and I talked about this with Simon. I took this book, I opened it up, a binder, put in sticky notes on what I didn't know and went back to her and said, now, what's this mean? And just got a good understanding. And that was the beginning of my social media career. And that, that's literally how I started. Um, and then he said, do you want to blog? Me? Absolutely. Went back to my desk and turned around and asked somebody who was sitting next to me, what's a blog? And they told, they explained it to me, right? And I said, oh, like an editorial. I'm a middle-aged black lady, right? Like an editorial. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I started writing stuff like I read in the papers a kid growing up and wrote a blog for many years about leadership. It was cool. It was fun. I had to take a, a little bit of a step back. How did you approach employee engagement and development when you were in, more in that role? The first thing is to treat people like you want to be treated, period. I would love the military people who would tell me, ah, military, I can't do this. I said, well, so am I. And yes, you can. Because if I can change, so can you. So I, I think it's just, 
you always got to whip them. You got to find out well, what's in it for them and you got to explain to them their benefit in the change. Otherwise, people aren't going to get it. Let's face it, right? So I've always tried to explain what they can gain out of whatever it is. And I'm going to say for me in leadership, you need to know your people. You need to know why they took the job. If you understand that, then you can apply everything back to that. Was it to, you know, have food for your child? Was it to provide college for your kid? Was it to buy a new car? Whatever it is, let's talk about that. And if we're satisfying that need, then we're good. Definitely. Did you have a your motivating or, or big why that kept you going? I had a stepmother that told me I was going <laughs> to, God, you're good. You get stuff out of me I don't tell people. I had a stepmother uh, when I was growing up that told me I was going to end up being a, a prostitute on the corner. She's pet. She's gone now, so God rest her soul because I'm a good Southern kid. But I didn't, of course, end up doing that. So my motivation was always to show her you don't know anything. Yeah, that was really that was my motivation. And there was one other. Uh, m- my mom died when I was 12. And my mother's last words to me were go to school. And I took that, literally. I'd have a PhD right now, but I think I'm too old to get the return on my investment. And when I talk to people like that, they were like, you know, you're crazy. And I'm like, you just want my money. Because wearing the fuzzy hat and graduating and having a doctor in front of your name would be really cool. But I'm not paying you that much money because I'm never going to get any return on my investment. (laughs) So then you find yourself taken over Jason's job, social media manager, essentially. Well, actually, it was, at the time, no, it was uh, it was an internal social media platform. It was more like Facebook internal for TSA. Um, but that led to other external social media things. And finally, again, a friend of mine said, hey, why don't you apply for this job? I was having fun where I was. I had a great boss. I worked with great people. I kind of took on the jobs that I wanted because I've been around long enough. And why don't you apply for this job? We could really use you. I'm like, are you crazy? And it was Ask TSA. So it was Ask TSA. It's like, I am not running a call center. I don't want to do it. I don't care. I'm not interested. She convinced me to apply. I applied. I had an interview. I was like, huh, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. I could care less. I sat down for my final interview. And at the time, the deputy administrator uh, for for public affairs was interviewing me. And uh, he said, so Janice, why do you want this job? And I said, oh, I don't. And it it just came out because I was very relaxed. I didn't want the job. And, you know, and I said, okay, so what I meant was that I was trying to clean it up. I went back downstairs to my, my then current boss and I said, she said, how'd you do? I said, oh, I, I messed that up. I screwed it up. I'm never getting that job. And so uh, you know, I told her what I did. And so the day that I saw on my phone that I had been selected for this job, I thought it was hilarious. I said, they messed up. I know they didn't select me because I, I totally messed up. They really had selected me. I mean, I was laughing. I'm like, oh, this is going to be so much fun because I'm, I'm going to like, you know, give them a rough time about it. You know, they're going to have to give me some more money, whatever. No, they really selected me for the job. So I took it. Then my boss said, you should take the job. I'm like, really? She said, take the job, Janice. It'll be good for you. So I took the job. At the time, STSA had a hour and a half wait time just for you to be able to get an answer. An hour and a half. And all they kept saying was, is, can you get that to a half an hour? Can you get that to a half an hour? I tried everything I knew. I studied data. I studied the people. I studied everything. I could not get it down really any closer to like 40 minutes. So then I started thinking about other possibilities. What else is out there? There's nothing else. I I have squeezed this as much as I could. There was nothing else out there. So I thought about artificial intelligence. So the redundant questions, can I bring my gun? No. Can I bring my knife? No. Can I bring, you know, my gallon of milk? No. Those questions don't need a person. 
And that's when I knew I had found my niche in life. I was really, I had fun because there was no challenge that we couldn't do. That was the beginning. And then after we did that, I brought in, uh, right before I left, I brought in text messaging. So now you can text to literally the words, ask TSA, text that in and they will answer you. So, you know, I put my mark there. I left, um, but that was the first couple of years. And then they told me they were giving me the whole thing, all of social media. It was some, uh, I'm gonna call it political, internal federal government stuff, but I had all of social media. So I had the posting that was going on. And then I had Ask TSA. And I gotta tell you, out of all of the jobs I've ever done in my life, that is the one I've enjoyed the most. It didn't make me as much money as UPS, but that's the one I enjoyed the most. Oh man, that's so cool. You're able to use all of your skills though. Your like leadership skills, you're great at communication because of <laughs> leadership, <laughs> being able to figure out, you know, what makes people tick. It was a lot of fun. I had a great team. And I think that's really the end all be all to success on anything is having the right people with you. My team was a little bit of everybody. I kept telling them, listen, our next hire needs to be a Native American because we don't have one. <laughs> we need a Native American, you know, but I, I prided myself on having a very diverse team, um, ages, locations, even nationalities. So it was just a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to learn. Absolutely. It's one of the very few social media accounts that I follow and engage with that really over you know a long period of time is able to communicate cross culturally. And no matter, I think, who's viewing it, you're able to receive, especially I think the most incredible part of it is truly that sprinkling of humor into it because people learn best when they're happy and they're open and they're engaged. And then you remember it because it's funny. That's perfect. Uh, I can die and go to heaven now. <laughs> uh, and let me explain it. If we weren't getting, our followers were really just diving on uh, Instagram. Like they, they got a million followers and then immediately started tanking. And again, that challenge from that deputy administrator, Janice, you got to get it back over, up over a million. Again, I try everything I can think of. I'm studying numbers, data, you know, because like, this is where you start, right? And I'm not getting anything. And so finally I said, well, what are people talking about? So I, my team, what are they talking about? They gave me all kinds of crazy things. For example, and this is one that just comes to my brain, even though I never let them do this, is the kid eating corn. On Instagram, it's like, or maybe it was TikTok, they were eating corn. I'm like, eating corn? No, we're not going to talk about eating corn, you know? But they kept, I mean, they tried hard. But whatever the, the public was talking about, that's what I wanted to talk about. That was it. Let's talk about what they're talking about, and then let's add in a travel tip. And we started to go up, and we never quit. And they're still going up. You know, the bird in the airport, the squirrel running across the floor. Do they have pre check? You know, things you think about. The guy going up the escalator the wrong way with the suitcase on the back, and he's not going any place. You know, and then one of my employees was actually in the airport and saw somebody skateboarding through and was able to capture the videos like priceless. We'll start on we'll start on thing. When you were an actual TSA agent, boots on the ground in the airport, was there a specific, totally wacky incident that you can recall? I think the one that I will always remember, there are two. There are two. One was the very first butcher knife that I caught going through x-ray. And, you know, I'm, I'm brand new. I think this is one of my first times on x-ray by myself. It's got to be like one of the first one or two days, right? And so I keep thinking, this is a test. This is not real. And I look up at the line. I look at the people in the line. Everybody looks like good, normal, everyday people. I mean, it's nobody with a big light on that says I'm a terrorist, right? So I call over somebody to take a look. And uh, at first he thinks it's a test. And then he yells supervisor. At that point, I know this is, this is real. And I'm thinking, oh, no, I just did. I did something good. You know, like I got to stop this butcher knife. But the woman who had the butcher knife was a woman dressed to the tens. 
looked like she was, I mean, she could have been president. You know what I'm saying? She looked really businesslike. And her, her answer was, is, oh, I forgot I had that in my purse. And my brain goes, you walk around with a butcher knife in your purse? So that's one. And the other is a guy who, once again, this time I wasn't on x-ray, but I was the person that got called over, right? And it looks like a hand grenade. So we're sitting there and your brain is going, am I going to die today? Because this is a hand grenade in this x-ray tunnel, right? So all kinds of things go through your brain of, I didn't wake up for this. I didn't sign up for this. This is wrong. You know what I'm saying? When the guy looks at me and he says, do I look like a terrorist? Because, you know, he's figured out that we're calling cops over at this point, right? And I'm just looking at him because I'm thinking, dude, everybody looks like a terrorist until I know different, right? Because this is my job. It turned out it was a belt buckle, but you couldn't see the belt. All you could see was the buckle. And he says to me, sister, tell him, tell him I'm not a terrorist. I'm thinking, I am not your sister, okay? Two, I don't know you and don't get me into this. All right. And number three, if I did know you, I would tell you not to be so stupid. Right. So uh, it ended up being a belt buckle. But for a minute there, we were shutting down the airport, you know, because we don't know what we have. The bomb squad's coming. The police are coming. And you're sitting there going, oh, man, I really wanted to record something on television tonight and I'm not going to make it. So those are my those are my two favorites. What happens in those instances when someone has a knife taken away or a gun taken away? What like? It depends on the airport in the state. So different states have different different jurisdictions. Okay. Um, But the police come over. They can be fined. They can be locked up depending on the level of the incident. Uh, But as soon as everything is cleared by the bomb squad and the police, we open the airport up and go right back to work. So a lot of times people don't understand that that TSO may not be happy because 20 minutes ago we shut down the airport and they thought they were going to die. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, you just don't, you you just, you may not just be happy right now because you're still trying to grasp the fact that somebody just brought a gun in and it was loaded or a knife in or whatever. So they're there to actually help and protect and they have a, a very hard job. You've had a hell of a career across all these diverse industries. Are there any key takeaways that come to mind or lessons learned that are from your entire career now? First off, I don't think there are any bad lessons learned. I think that with everything that happens, even if, if it's you learning what not to do, then it's a good lesson because you learn something good. When I was thinking back this morning uh, about that question and my brain said what I have really learned from many people is to have patience and be strategic. You're always playing the long game. I had someone say to me one time that managing people is like a chess game. They move, you move, they move, you move. And you just keep going back and forth. And that's it. It's it's no different. You all end up parting ways because they leave or because you terminate them. Because sadly enough, that does happen. Then one of you goes checkmate. So patience and strategy. Is everything. I have had some of my friends and some of my employees tell me I strategize air. And I probably do. Because I'm always thinking about that next step or thinking about how could that insult someone, which is a part of running any government social media account. You cannot discriminate because you're the government, you know. <laughs> so you need to make sure that everybody is is happy. Try that on. That's fun. That is absolutely wild to me. And so now that you're retired, which I find that very hard to believe based off of <laughs> I'm a middle aged black woman, it's good. I say I say retired because I, I have a hard time believing that uh, you're gonna stop doing all the things that uh you enjoy doing. What are you up to now? Um uh, I'm gonna stop doing all the things that I enjoy doing. I um so I've had many jobs. I've had fun in 
in all of those jobs at one point in time. I don't know what I want to do. I've been told that I'm not supposed to sit on my tuchus and I'm supposed to get out there and talk to people and share the knowledge that I have. I've been told that I helped or started the revolution for the government changing how they do social media, which just wigs me out to me. This little kid that grew up in Atlanta with pigtails did that. But I, I don't I don't know. I have a pod, not a podcast. I have a uh, keynote speaker event coming up soon. And I think that's going to be a lot of fun. But I don't know. I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. And I don't know if I want to keep working. I just want to have fun. So I thought about all kind of things. You know, maybe I'll go and push somebody around in the airport in a wheelchair or maybe I'll go entertain little old people at old folks homes. I have no idea. I just I don't know. Give me some ideas and let me think about them. All right? That sounds good to me. That sounds good to me. And Maybe I'll become a tour guide and live in a bus for a van for a couple of years. I can help you do that. <laughs> I know I know a lot of ways we can make that happen. I would be more than happy to make that oh, happen. Oh, my goodness. I don't know if I can do the van part. I, I, I'm kind of up, but I need a hotel. You know what I'm saying? That's fair. With no That's bed fair. bugs. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, you know, clean sheets, you know. I respect that. Now the wheels are turning. I'll follow up. We'll have some okay. ideas. Ooh, follow up. I can see my new job that I got that I had no idea I was going to do, but I like traveling. It's fun. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. And before we go, I do ask every awesome person that comes on this podcast two questions. What is the worst piece of advice that you've ever gotten? And on the other hand, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever gotten? I'm going to go back to, I don't think there was any worse advice because even the bad advice taught me not to do that. And I, I even learned how to answer a phone from a guy who used to, his mother used to yell at me. <laughs> she would call UPS days. She would call up and ask to speak to her son. And, and we, I, everybody knew him by his nickname. I didn't know his name wasn't Buck, you know, and she called and asked to speak to somebody else one day, ma'am, you have the wrong number. And, Anyway, I guess I was always talking fast because, you know, I'm going, 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 going. So uh, he taught me how to answer the phone. You see what I'm saying? So if you can learn, and fuck if you hear this, uh, thanks, dude. If you can, you know, so if you take whatever you can learn from somebody, because there's value in everybody. And then the best thing I think I've ever been taught is truly to be strategic. And that's come from many people with many lessons. And the one person who taught me to have patience when I never really wanted to. I even got a patience rock once and I lost it. So I was carrying it in my pocket. I lost it because I took those, those slacks off and I didn't think about it. It was still in my pocket. And I kept walking around saying, I lost patience. I lost patience. But be careful when you ask for patience, because when I prayed for patience, I got two kids. And getting those kids, kids will teach you patience. And I'm like, okay, I got it. I'm good, you know. Um, but uh, so, yeah, that's it. Patience and strategy is everything. I love it. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for sharing everything today. Lindsay, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for listening to The Cost of the Status Quo and learning the wisdom, stories, and ideas that will have you feeling inspired and ready to take on the world. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to share, rate, and review. It means the world to me and the team putting it all together. If you're looking for more information, you can find us at costofthestatusquo.com or on Instagram at costofthestatusquo. If you've got any questions or curiosity about me, you can find me at lindsaylearner.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-L-E-R-N-E-R.com or on Instagram at lindsaylearner. Thanks again for listening. Hope you have an awesome day.